All right. Keep running out of chances here, so I'll uh, do a quick review, overview of the machine here. Um, this header is all hydraulic driven. There's no belt or chains on it. it. Can be a good and bad thing. Hydraulic controls, you got more control over everything. Um, like reel speed, um, draper speed, knife speed is set in stone. Uh, can't do anything about that, but also could be a bad thing because if something goes wrong with one of these things, it can be expensive. So it's not like a belt or a chain or a pulley or something like that where, <clears throat> you know, it'd be a little bit less expensive, but it, but it does make this a little bit more simplistic though, less stuff on here. Um, it's got the U2 universal reel on here for this one. Um, the knife drive, there's three different types. I think it can be a Carrera, Schumacher, or the New Holland knife drive. This one is New Holland knife bar on here, which actually is really nice for us because our bar mowers, our Rouse bar mowers, use the same style, so I can use the same sections. Guards, I'm, I'm not sure, but it could be the same guards too. These are different guards on here, a little bit different, you know, type. Um, but the same tie downs on here for knife clearances all the way across here. So stuff matches up, makes it really nice. So it is a dual knife drive. So eight pretty much eighteen was that come to yeah, eighteen feet per knife. Um, so it overlaps here. This is really important here to have this made correctly. It's been okay so far, I haven't had too much trouble with it, but that middle hump plate there, we actually made that for this year. Um, it's to help distribute the crop towards the sides here. And if you know anything about light crops, um, you know, if they're not in the windrow, it, it's hard to pick them up when there's not much there. So we hope this helps divide it up a little bit to both drapers then. And, or it'll just kind of make a little, a little small pile when it gets enough it'll get kicked back make a tiny small pile and it picks up pretty good then so even in the thick crops it doesn't bother at all really so it does does really good so I'd say it, it's helped out a bit you know it could be maybe a little bit better but for you know costing hardly nothing to put that on uh, I think that's a win it does have this one has a built-in header transport down here um, it's a little awkward, I would say. It's not as nice to say as McDonald's self-included transport on our flex header up there. Um, but essentially, you know, these tires are used for the gauge wheels. There's a gauge wheel here and a gauge wheel there. But putting a transport, you actually take those wheels off of there. That wheel goes on that side underneath the knife. This wheel goes here. This thing drops down. Um, but you can't put this wheel on right away here because, well, of course, it would hit this for hooking up and unhooking. So there's a, there's a jack that goes on here, so you jack this up then, and that's how it sets, supports the header here. Uh, if you want to put in a transport, so you can get the wind rower out of the way then. It's okay, but it's a little awkward. Hooking up isn't bad. Unhooking, it's a little weird. You know, it's not like it's, you know, way it unhooks and everything. It's a little awkward, unbalanced, I would almost say you gotta be slow adjustments with it didn't unhook, but um, hooking it up this time around though well, I'll get to that in a minute you know, with the wind rower here Get, getting it you know, I think everything's solved on it now, the problems we had with it initially, when we first bought it um, it was really easy hooking it up <laughs> unbelievable, like, it, hooking it up this year was easy peasy, nothing to it. So, but anyways, with the gauge wheels though, you can, you know, depending on how high you think you're gonna cut the crop, usually you know you kind of can set your gauge wheels then for this. All these things they're not really supposed to support the header. They're just made to help the header float across the field a little bit. You know, it takes a little bit of weight off the machine, but it is mainly to help keep the header grounded. You know, so keeps it kind of riding in the field consistently so that's what these things are for depending on your cut height you know like we we're cutting it fairly short this year so we have it set a little bit lower uh, the gauge wheel up 
more, but still having enough compression to have it float good. But if you're say you're taking crops higher, yeah, you'd have this thing jacked down several more inches. So, or well, that's about it for this header. Uh, when we because we, we bought these machines used last year, but when we initially got it though, it was unusable. Uh, the dealership lied to us, but I'll get more into that. Just briefly touch that a little bit, but essentially though, this motor had to get new seals in it. It was leaking like a sow. <laughs> uh, of course, this year that one draper bearing went out on, yeah, it was this side here. Front draper bearing up here went out. Rusty galore. Surprised it lasts as long as it did. Uh, we placed knife bearings last year. Um, what else? Oh, the, the reel was actually hitting the deck up here. It was out of adjustment. It was hitting the deck at several places. There was a bunch of broken fingers on here. So we had to readjust everything. Now it clears with flying colors. I'm doing a lot of comparisons here between this thing and our McDon head over here. Um, like on our McDon head, we haven't broken a finger on that thing yet. And this thing, you know, we've broken a few already. Even on our old Premier swath or pull tape swath that we had, that we've only we only broken a handful of fingers on that reel. And, um, this thing, I think, just everything is. This is some pretty cheap fingers on here. So, but I see he's loose. Why is he loose? <laughs> Anyways, so you know, but finger reel does work good on this thing though. It it, it works good. Had some laid over oats and laid over flaxseed. It's it picks it up just fine. So works good. Oh yeah, these end shield type things where this whole thing right here, it's pretty flimsy. Um, this one has a lot, I think it's, no, it's the other one. The other one has a lot more slop in it because it's been beat up a bit before we've had it. We did some spot welding on it and reinforcement and, you know, they could have this a little bit beefier really, the sides here. I know they're trying to, you know, have it as light as possible to have, you know, least amount of weight on the machine. The wind rower makes sense, but within reason, though. It's got to be within reason, though. I just think these are a little too cheap. The paint on here is pretty pathetic. It was like this on our first flex header we had when we bought our CR Combine. We actually had a New Holland head for it. For what is it? was a 72C header or something like that. And it was the same thing on that thing. The paint. Just bad paint. I don't, I don't know why. I, the knife on here, it does have polys underneath. I don't know if you can see them from here. Yeah, you can kind of see them a little bit there. Uh, yeah, you get it there. Yeah, you can kind of see the poly there. Um, the way it's designed, I mean, it. this thing does not like wet dirt. It, it, does, it doesn't. Um, last year, with our soybeans, you know, the ground was so wet, we had that blizztober happen our McDon head I mean it still pushed dirt yet but not nearly as bad where you could catch it in time and lift up and just be on your way again this thing when this thing starts catching dirt underneath it compounds quickly and you either depends where it happens on the this header on the knife if it happens more along the draper here you have a chance it'll clean itself off it happens in the center there you have to get out of the out of the machine and clean your knife off because it will not clean off so it all has to do with the polys underneath because on the McDon the polys kind of go underneath the guards a little bit. I mean, it makes it a little bit more of a bugger having to remove guards or something like that on that thing. It's a little more difficult, uh, but this thing's real easy to remove the guards, but that thing handles damp ground a lot better than this thing ever will. So let's say good and both good and bad things about it, but, but overall though, this thing, um, it's worked okay so far. It, you know, is what it is. Um, those knife bearings, I think, are going to be more of a common thing to replace more often because, well, this knife does run fast, and they do run warm. Those knife bearings, they do run warm, both of them. So, I think that's going to be more of a common thing on this header, but. It, it's been it's been cutting pretty well, you know, doing all the flexi. It, it it does cut it well. So, anyways, now let's get to the the wind rower here. <coughs> um, 
I guess we'll just start on this side, I suppose. The engine. The engine is a four-cylinder, 126 horsepower engine. It's a little engine for what it has to do. Um, this thing is capable of running all the swather heads, all the haybine heads, but it cannot run a disbine head because there's not enough horsepower for it. So that's where you need the, uh, the next step up then. But it's also more expensive though too. Um, maintenance on it has been really easy. All the maintenance I've done on it, it's really easy. Um, hydraulic reservoir right here, sight glass. Um, this one has two hydraulic filters because it's the draper ready units have an auxiliary pump on here to run the drapers. You know, it's got a kind of a well, not really, it shares the same system, but it's just an extra pump for powering the drapers. So that's why there's a, there's two extra two hydraulic filters, one for the main pump, one for the auxiliary. Draper ready units. Uh, I forget. I think this is for the drapers here, or is it? Yeah, I think this is for the drapers here. This block right here, valve block. Um, and also, this valve block will be a little bit different. Draper ready units. They they have an, they have separate right and left hand float pressures for the lift arms and the accumulators as well. Um, so you have two separate dump valves, and you have a, it's a little bit more involved here. This thing is a very finicky thing here. This was kind of our main problems here. Um, went through every single valve on here, replaced, replaced a couple of them, and now it seems to be working properly now compared to last year. So, um, so if you're having any troubles with hydraulics on here, something, uh, something's not working right. Chances are. You need to look in the diagrams and figure out which valve is controlling what, what it's tied into, and then you start from there. Then and you check the O-rings and the seals on those valves to see, make sure nothing's burst or anything like that, and make sure the valve is working properly too. Like nothing's, it's tight and not flopping around where there's no like the spring is broken inside. That's what happened with the one of the main valves on here. That's why it wasn't working right. One valve was really bad so this thing very finicky and expensive piece right here this whole block here it's, but it's really important though if you want your machine to run good so learn that um, engineer take filter right here oil check dipstick right here fuel filters water separator and main fuel filter coolant reservoir right here Two batteries, one battery on either side. Um, this engine has no DEF on it. Uh, even though this is a 2013 model, and so is the the Draper head. Um, but the engine was manufactured before 2011. It's on the badge here. I think it said like 2008. I forget where it's written again here. But anyways, though they were you know, they're manufactured before 2011 before the regulations kicked in, so uh, you know, this thing has no DEF, which is really nice. Um, less thing to worry about. It's real simple back here. Um, engine gearbox right here. It's 79 or 7590 synthetic oil. That should be replaced every time the engine oil is changed. And this side, here's the other battery right here. Engine oil filter right here. About it for this side, I guess. So, um, pretty self explanatory. You can see the pumps right here, both pumps. I think the main pump is here and the auxiliary is up there. Fuel tank, I think it's a 120 gallon fuel tank. A lot of fuel. This thing sips fuel for what it can do, it does pretty good with fuel. Um, cab air filter, wash fluid. Um, this does have a mounted flaxseed. Canola roller back here. Um, use this these chains to kind of set because they're they're spring loaded here, so it kind of helps the roller to kind of float a little bit more. So it does it's not just packing down as hard as it can. It just you know packs down enough, and then it kind of helps just kind of floats over and then so it doesn't you know crush it so so terribly much. Then but so the radiator super easy to clean it. Pull the lever down. Open this up. 
pull this oil cooler out of the way and ta-da. Got access to a lot of things here. Only thing is this, the coolant radiator here, uh, it's a little harder to get to if this thing doesn't move. The best way to do it though is to get in just from the sides here and blowing through here wherever you can. So uh, it's very important to keep those radiators clean because, well, they need to have as much cooling capacity as they can possibly have, which I will revisit here in a little bit. One kind of downside of this thing is I wish it had a little bit more cooling capacity on it. And that wind is picking up more and more and more. Oh yeah, the, the firewall here. This thing, I actually had to cut notches in it up there by those hoses and down here by this main hydraulic line here. They were rubbing, so I notched them out a little bit. So I quit rubbing on those hoses. Um, yeah, I got two grease points here on the steering wheel here for, this, for the steering valve here. Two grease points there and a grease point up there. You can get access. Those are on the side here, easy to grease. So keep them well lubricated so your steering wheel turns free all the time. Um, it's got the rear and air suspension here. To set that, it's just a you know, compressed air tire, you know, tire valve. You just that's where you fill air out. This valve right here, easy peasy. Um, boy, it, see, it looks bowed right now because I got the wheels cocked the wrong way and it's not on level ground either. But to set them, you want to be on level ground the wheels the other way like you were driving forward and kind of where you think you're going to be cutting most of the time. And that's when you come back here and you set this then and you kind of make sure this is level you know it's kind of straight across underneath here then for the consist most consistent ride then. Um, oh yeah the draper units here they don't have much for shields here just the really small shields here fixed shields they're set in stone um, that's what the Draper units have because they want you want to have the least amount of stuff down here in case you get big fluffy windrows here, either with like canola, flaxseed, you know, whatever. You don't want so much stuff here to get caught on, so that's what those shields are. That's what they come with anyways. So if I ever get a haybine head for this, you know, this is what it's going to have to be for a haybine head. There's no going to be no other shields if I want to make the windrow tighter. You know, it's just the way it's going to be. I mean, I guess I could buy the other shields but they're really expensive though they're, they're well over a thousand dollars for the for the kit so it's just like yeah whatever <laughs> this is fine anyways for hay drying I want, the, want a big window for drying down the hay anyways so header lock you have the header up all the way throw the lever back locks into place toolbox here move this lever forward and lifts up here it gets really dirty in here so that's why I got this toolbox within a toolbox so it keeps stuff cleaner in there so but it is what it is so you put some stuff in there all right so here's just some grease points here grease point here down here there's one more on the back side of the cut height cylinder uh, there's one more zerk here it goes back for the lift arm there same with the other side the other side has another grease zerk for the steering column. Um, there's also a little black switch that I'll show it in a little bit when I crawl up, but that's for running the tilt cylinder for hooking up. Makes it easier. This thing has the quick catch on it, so there's no bolts to remove. Well, I guess there is a bolt to remove, but there's no bolts to take out for the main cup on the arm. All you do is take this little bolt out, pull the lever out to the side. A little plate slides into the arm so that it's free to unhook, and that's all it is. It's a lot easier than having to remove a big bolt on the cup. It just makes it real, real simple. Just having to remove that bolt and pulling the lever out then. So, oh yeah, Draper ready units. Um, I should say the non-Draper the non units only have lift cylinders on either side. The Draper ready units, they have an extra set of cylinders in here. Cut height cylinders. That's so you can adjust your cut height the header up here then because usually for like a hay bind or a disc bind you know most of the time you they're set the cut height set on the header themselves they just kind of float across the ground then this thing however 
Sometimes you don't want to be you don't want to be dragging the, across the ground the whole time. That's not, that's not a good thing. A lot of times you're gonna have your cut height cylinder set so you're not scraping the ground. You you want to be off the ground, you know, leaving stubble behind, as much stubble as you can. So that's where these cut height cylinders come into play then. But we have the little switch up here, right here. This is for the tilt cylinder, running the tilt cylinder for unhooking and hooking up the machine. Uh, it relieves pressure, runs the tilt cylinder, so makes it real easy unhooking and hooking up. Um, last year this didn't work because we were having valve issues with it. Um, so this year it actually worked. What a difference. What a difference when everything actually flipping works. So, but that's probably it for the outside of the machine here inside and the cab I think the cab is pretty nice really easy to walk in here sit down um, pretty good visibility I think real good visibility all around front sunshade and a rear sunshade but of course I wish these were completely blotched out but it's just waiting on this thing to doing it but whatever buddy seat both cloth seats which these seats are very comfortable, so glad they're just cloth seats. Real comfortable. Climate control right here, windshield wiper. Lights, uh, the lights, they're okay. They're nothing spectacular. They seem a little dull. They should be LEDs because they got, I think they got three lights up here, three lights here, and then there's some down by the axles here shining towards the back of the header so you can see your stubble behind you. Um, steering column here. I think it's pretty standard stuff. The steering column tilts itself. The, the steering wheel tilts as well here with this lever. Moves this more. Telescoping steering wheel. Um, horn, turn signal, hazard lights. Of course, radio, whatever. I got a CB here. They had a built in antenna in here. The antenna seems kind of weak in here, but whatever. On the right hand console here. Armrest here. Some storage underneath. Some power plugs here. This one has the cold start package right here. I think it only works when I think the outside ambient temperature or the coolant temperature is 40 degrees or below or something like that. I don't remember exactly how cold it has to be again, but um, park switch, transmission, low low speed and high speed. Um, it doesn't go that fast. I think, I think the top RPM is 2,300 RPM on this engine. When I was going down the highway with it you know, at about 2,000 RPM in high gear, it was going about 14 and a half miles an hour. So you do the math. Now this is where it kind of gets a little different for Draper units. Um, this they have two float switches here, one for your left hand and one for the right hand. This is where you set the pressures so that um, the header lowers down evenly with how all the systems are tied in with the left and right hand side of the machine. Um, these values will not be identical ever. It's just wherever they want to be set to where <clears throat> the header lowers evenly down to the ground. And so there's, you know, a certain amount of float pressure, you know, takes a certain amount of weight to be able to lift up the sides of the header then too. So this switch is for if you had a draper head that can be side delivery, you know, this is where it would be used to change the position of the draper decks on the header. Draper speed switch right here, speeding up or slowing down the drapers. Real speed, automatic or manual, you usually have it in auto, it's based upon ratio to your ground speed, which you can adjust on the fly as well. This does have a power reverser, um, haven't used it yet on this, on the swather head, I guess it'd be more useful for a haybine head to get slugged for some reason, but um, I think when you put into a reverser, you run your header engage switch, and I think it runs it for like five seconds, then it shuts it off, then automatically, then again. But I haven't had to use it yet, so. But yeah, of course, this is the header engage switch right here. Um, that's that. It's got the IntelliView 4 monitor here. I'll go in that little bit here. It's pretty self-explanatory. Nothing much on there. It just does not have an electric fuel pump on it, or electrically controlled. It's all manual fuel pump use this throttle lever here, it's all manual, 
think the other models are electric, electrically controlled. So um, your joystick here, forward, reverse, um, real speed, speed up, slow down. The oh crap button stops your header. Um, header lift, header lower, reel up, reel down, reel four or reel aft, reel forward. Um, the reel fore and aft only works when the header is engaged because there's not enough hydraulic connections on the wind rower itself that they have it tied in with the system for the header drive and that's how it gets its oil supply and then there's a solenoid on the header itself that this is controlled by then so you can move the reel forward and reel to move backwards so that's just tied in there. This is for automatic GPS this auto engagement for GPS this doesn't have it so um, return to cut or raise header press it twice to raise the header all the way press it once to lower it to the ground based on where your cut heights and letters are set at um, tilt header tilt right here uh, cut height this is where the draper units have that extra setting that extra function here um, this is for your cut height cylinders um, the knife tilt here um, that controls this cylinder here um, the usual thing they had they usually have a decal down there you can kind of see that white paint we put on there because the decal was, was kind of missing so but I kind of flipped it around the other way here I put a broken rake tooth and some zip ties and color coding and lined it up and now I don't have to lean forward anymore to be able to see where the tilt cylinder is at all I have to do is just kind of look off to the side a little bit when I'm going and you can see everything clear as day where everything's set so just something as simple as that made it a lot easier to be able to see where the knife is currently set at for uh, tilt knife angle so I know where that's at so that's these controls here it does have a lateral tilt on this um, on the Draper units um, if you, there's two buttons back here if you press and hold this one and I use these two buttons here then um, it actually runs the right hand cylinder up or down a little bit um, so it kinda um, you know can raise or lower the right hand side of the header a little bit if you needed some lateral tilt I haven't used it much really haven't really had a need to it seems to follow the ground fairly well I got this steering wheel centered You'll have to, you know, starting these things, you, you have to make sure everything's centered and neutral. It'll tell you which way you have to turn the steering wheel. So if this light's blinking, you have to rotate the steering wheel left. Plus, it'll tell you on on screen then, um, you know, if something's not neutral. You know, steering wheel's not centered. This isn't a neutral. Park brake's not engaged. You know, it'll it'll, it'll let you know. It'll yell at you. Um, here's the, Here's the IntelliView 4 monitor. It's fairly straightforward. I mean, this is this is the main screen I usually have on all the time. The way I have these run screens set up. These things you can customize to whatever you want. Um, but this is the main screen I'm usually at all the time. Shows my header left and header right. Float pressure, as you can see, the values are really not similar, but that's just the way this machine just wants to be that's where it wants to be set at so that's where we have them could have them adjust a little bit differently too and then use your header drop pressure then to have a lower to the ground all the way then if you have them set for higher pressures um, all this does is allow you know it tells the machine to lower the flow pressure for a few seconds when you're initially lowering it to the ground to have a drop down pass. I think this is more or less to do with if you have lighter heads like this header here is going to be the heaviest header this current machine has to run um, so I don't really need to use that because it's heavy enough it drops down fast enough um, but if you have like a smaller header like if I had like a 12 foot haybine head a really small header yeah I'd probably need to utilize this to be able to you know drop to the ground all the way at a decent speed too um, but anyways, that's what you know. That is, you set the values through this. Cutter bar speed, reel speed, this work rates, temperatures, engine hours. Um, this is where I'm going to get back to cooling a little bit. <clears throat> Whatever the ambient temperature is at outside, I have to add 100 degrees to the hydraulic oil temperature after the header, you know, 
working with it, you know, running everything, driving, um, you know, that's the highest temperature it's going to get at with a clean radiator and no problems. Um, like on some of those 90 degree days when I was going, you know, that hydraulic oil temperatures got up to 190 degrees, 192 degrees. Um, it was like 94 degrees out, no wind, high humidity. I've t talked with a lot of people and they say these things run hot, but if you guys have a machine like this, New Holland case stage, John Deere, McDonald, whatever machine may be, if you know what your oil temperature, if it says your oil temperature is what, what it runs at, let me know in the comments below. I'm just kind of curious how warm some of the other machines run, but you know, and then like yesterday when I was swathing with it, cooler out, it was, you know, maybe like 70 degrees out and I think the hydraulic oil temperature only got up to 168 degrees and I was going. So it had a decent amount of wind as well and, you know, it stayed pretty cool. Coolant temperature, when you're, when it's running, you know, running the header, you know, going max RPM down the field and, you know, it usually hovers around that 185 to 189 degrees. It's just, usually just stays right there. So it doesn't, that doesn't have a problem there, but wish it did have more cooling capacity because heat is the biggest thing on this thing, you know, trying to power this whole big header here with the drapers and the drive wheels, drive motors as well. There's a lot of resistance and a lot of heat generation and I still think they can make these things a little bit wider. I don't know what the, the new speed roar series are like, but they could make these things a little bit wider. You got plenty of room. Make them a little bit wider back here, even make them a little bit longer and have bigger radiators installed. Simple as that. Just to have more heat dissipation. I mean, that's the biggest darn thing. I know when hydraulic oil gets warm, like 170, 180 degrees is really warm for hydraulics, so um, that's when it kind of breaks down. Oh, I know oil has come a long way, but still, though, it's still not good when stuff runs that warm. But it just makes case in point to change hydraulic oil more often. That's all there is to it. Monitoring that and the oil and you know, it takes a lot of power to run that. I mean, this thing's only 126 horsepower. Um, you know, it, <clears throat> it's using all 126 horses at times, so, you know, it's uh, not a very big engine, but it is what it is, though. I think the biggest thing is the drive motors to have the most resistance. You know, like when I was going down the highway, um, bringing it back home from the old farm, that, that the header's not engaged, just going down the, down the road. It got up to like yesterday when it was cooler out. It got up to like 150 degrees on the hydraulic oil, and that's without the header running. So, you know, I think a lot of the heat generation does come from the drive motors when that thing's going. A lot of resistance there takes takes power to move this thing. So, um, but then when when nothing's running, they just have them idling. Then he cools down pretty fast and it gets down, you know, you know, to normal levels. Then you know, anywhere from 120 to 140 degrees on the hydraulic temperature, which is good, so here for this um, machine anyways, so there's not much you can monitor, tinker with. It does have data management on here, you know, your land management stuff, if I had mapping on here, you know, it does not have, doesn't have GPS, so it was supposed to, but dealer lot, dealership lied to us when it came here, and saying that it was field ready was a big old lie too, so anyways though, but I think probably the most important screen here would be the calibrations. I haven't had to do any recalibrations on here. Everything's been okay. So hopefully I never have to tinker with that ever in its lifetime that everything just works. This, you can tinker with some stuff in here. You know, of course, your those run screens I was currently at, you can customize them. Um, and also some other information here. <clears throat> Headers. It does have a memory function. Um, you know, like I have a Draper header. So you can... Have your settings for that. I can say if I were to put a haybine head on here, I change the header type to haybine, and or I think it's actually called sickle, yeah, sickle, and you modify your settings where you think you need need it to be, um, and it will remember the settings for that then the next time you hook up or unhook headers. So it does remember. I think it's like up to three. I think I think it's all up up to three headers. So. I think it's if it's all different ones too, pretty sure. Yeah, I think it does store up to three different header types, yeah, memory functions, so. Diagnostics if you have fault codes and whatnot here, that's what this is for. So overall, this machine, 
it's okay, especially this year, getting Sonic where you have all the problems solved on it now. It seems to work a lot better this year, but um, it's okay. It's an okay machine. See, there's a few things about it I wish were a little different, but uh, I know there's a lot of nicer machines out there. Like that, I know that one we looked at. It was I don't know. It was like thirty or forty thousand dollars more for it, and with a smaller head or two. Um, it was a well, it was a John Deere, but it was MacDon built the wind rowers and whatnot for John Deere for several years. Um, drove test drove one of them. Guy had it for sale. Drew, test drove his, and that thing was just like butter and just smooth and. Um, but the price range was pretty steep for what we were looking for for the time. Um, so this machine we actually didn't look at in person because we were just running out of time and we looked at so many already and so we just took the dealer's word for it on this one and boy we took a little bit so a lot of you know, this this machine was not fueled already not even remotely close it makes me wonder how they got it even loaded in the header and hooked and everything and because yeah when you drove it around it drove just fine but once you start trying to run some of the hydraulic controls it's just like nothing's working right nothing's working out wires torn back here on the alternator and <clears throat> like nothing nothing working right just it was just a mess so um still like to get a hay head for it yet sometime but it's i'm still waiting for a good user to come along or because i hate to buy a new one that's expensive but it might happen depends on what a, a lot of things have to go right for that to happen but um no no rush right now um, plus with this machine too i'm not sure if this is gonna be a permanent thing how long it'll be around? Maybe we'll be end up selling it next year, or maybe we'll end up just keeping it. I don't know. Not sure at this point, but uh, Raldo was a pretty big learning experience on this machine. So yeah, it's it, it's something to get used to too. Like how this thing handles and drives these machines. It's something like I've never driven before. <laughs> steering the steering wheel. It's like a skid steer. You know, it controls the hydraulic flow to your drive wheels and you know it's really weird it's really weird driving these things but you know you can turn on a dime though with these things swing around and go right that back down the other way um sometimes it always makes me wonder too this year how how we did it with our pull types for all those years you know you can cut acres with this thing 36 feet five to seven miles an hour Unless the crop was really short, I was kind of going slower than not to ram into the ground then, cutting it so short, so going a little slower than you know four four miles an hour or something like that. And, but you can cover ground with this thing. If I missed anything, I'll I'll add it in to the end of this video. If I did think I missed something, I'll kind of add it in then. But uh, anyways, other than that, thanks for watching everybody, and talk to y'all later. Yeah, one thing I did forget to mention is when you unhook your header, when you got no header hooked up, gotta lock the suspension with this big pin here. There's another one on the other side too. Gotta lock them so, you know, because if you don't lock them and you unhook, it will collapse the back end. Then you gotta jack it up then and put your pins in then. So, the more you know. A quick add on to my video now that I actually unhooked this thing again. Um, kind of maybe figured something out here for unhooking now. It's still finicky yet, but anyways, for hooking it up now, um, it's not as big of a deal. Yeah, mosquitoes. Get mosquitoes coming here now. But uh, for hooking up here, just as long as you're on level ground, that's the biggest thing. Um, you get the arms lined up, the cups underneath here, lined up on the bolts underneath here. What I like, what I kind of did this fall when I initially hooked it up is, you know, the best thing to do is have the jacks up pretty high, because then it makes it real easy then, but I didn't have the jacks up high enough, but at least I was on level ground where I would start lifting it up, because the header wants to teeter forward as you lift it up, but that jack and that tire over there are going to hold the header to, to some extent. So what I did is I just kind of just slowly lifted it up, little by little, until I had enough room where the tilt cylinder would come through here then it wouldn't hit up here the tilts had enough to come here and get the pin in then and then 
lift it up then. Well, don't lift it up all, all the way yet, but um, lift it up a little bit. Attach, make sure it's locked into position then, either through a bolt or, um, you know, depending on the style you have, we have the quick attach on ours, you know, just a, uh, a lever. Um, you know, you get them attached, then make sure it's secured. Lift up all the way, lock the header in the up position, and then hydraulic lines up, electrical connection up. Um, transport wheels, gauge goes to gauge wheels either side, and then the transport hitch, um, we take ours off on this side, the hitch, we take the hitch off. I think it, it can actually fold in so it can stay on the machine, but we like to get off because it's less weight. That's why you notice like the float pressures are more, what do you want to call it, discrepancy between left and right. Our machine, well, we have less weight on the left side here with taking that transport hitch off. But it kind of takes two people to get it back on then, but less weight the better though. So that's why we just take it off. So, um, yeah, and what I like to do too, I like to loosen the drapers then too on it, just because easier on the drapers then, so. But unhooking, pretty much the opposite. You know, have the header up all the way locked into the up position so it can fall down. Um, of course, take your gauge wheels off, get them ready to be mounted. Um, mount the one gauge wheel on the one side, put the jack down for this close tire here. Get the jack down over there, but the biggest thing I noticed this year for unhooking it is I had the jacks up, you know, the header up all the way. I pretty much had the jacks real close to touching the ground. And that's where I had the easiest getting the tilt cylinder unhooked because, you know, every, the, everything would kind of touch on the ground then. Um, but also what I like to do too is raise my float pressures my left and right hand float pressures and then you know so it doesn't lower the header so blasted fast then it'll lower it a lot slower um and then i will lower my float pressures then slowly and let the header just kind of slowly set on the ground and the rest of the way and then i drop it all the way down to header removal mode zero psi um once you do that then then you come out and see if you can remove your tilt cylinder pin if it's if it's loose um after you ran your tilt cylinder relief pressure, either from in the cab or if you have that external switch, the front side of the machine. Um, but do not remove this pin if there's pressure on it. If you do, you can get seriously injured or killed. Um, which is probably reason why this was bent because when it wasn't, because as I mentioned before, I don't know how they got this header unhooked when they sent it down here to us when we bought it. You know, it's just like, because this was actually bent here. Uh, I think it was bent this way, so it, chances are they forced it out when it was at the dealership before they loaded it. So, and there's some other things too, but um, but yeah, that's the main thing is make sure this tilt cylinder is loose. Once you get that loose, then what I like to do then is to shut the machine off and I turn the valves on the valve block, just dump valves. Um, I like to use that to lower the lift arms then real slowly then to the ground then. So, instead of trying to run it from the joystick in the machine. Um, I like to do it from the dump valves because then I can slowly do it just in a controlled environment practically and slowly make sure everything, you know, they all, they both come down. If one doesn't come down, there's probably a little bit of pressure on it. You might have to wedge a little bit or something like that, but you know, they should come down then. So, but of course before unhooking this and unhooking your arms, you know, have everything else ready, transport ready, jacks ready, all your connection hydraulics disconnected, you know, just so the only thing that's connected are the arms and the tilt cylinder, then you can safely drop the header then after you get everything disconnected. The main the main thing being is getting this tilt cylinder loose. That's the biggest thing. That's why you know, I kind of figured out to have the jacks, you know, when the header's all the way up to have the jacks pretty close to touching the ground is gives the best bet to unhook them or even having the jacks touch the ground too is probably fine too so you know just kind of a trick the hay bind head i don't know how that would work for sure i guess it would just sets on the ground so probably be a little different but pretty similar though it's probably a, it'd probably be a lot easier to drop a hay bind head on the ground though definitely you know because i think they have hay bind heads have two jacks on either side and uh you know that thing just lowers all the way to the ground and should be everything should be loose then so 
But this thing though is a little finicky though. It is. But we have to, you know, remove it. More optimized storage. And also, it's greasing those cups then too on the lift arms on the machine. Getting fresh grease in there. If you don't, you will wear them down. So, from the, the pivoting on here. So, from running the tilt. That's enough for today. I wonder if that's going to rain. I don't know what the heck is going on here. Cold front's coming through. We have blustery winds tomorrow, so 